Hello, everybody. How are you doing this fabulous Saturday? It's good to see you. I made an extra frothy latte. I love when that happens, when the frother just goes crazy. I don't know if it's the humidity here in Texas. But I got a fully loaded cup this morning. So my mug today, if you can see it, oh, the glare. Glare the glare. It is a color changing mug. And right now it shows my battery is full. My battery is full because I'm coming to you live here. Well, kind of live. You'll notice a little difference in this show. But welcome. Welcome. I hope you will grab a mug or a bottle of water or a tea or whatever it is that you're drinking. Pull up a chair. Let's catch up. Let's talk about stories. Do you like stories? I love stories. I love talking about stories. Um, I love reading stories. I love helping authors craft stories and tell their best stories. So speaking of best stories, there were some great stories this week, but we'll be fully loaded. So yes, this is my fully loaded color changing mug and we'll know that it's time to go when this starts going down, the color changes or, you know, I know that I've sat it too long on my desk and I have to go warm it up again. And the thing about color changing mugs is you can't put them in the microwave or it messes up the color changing thing, you know? So you got to drink your mug. You got to drink your mug of coffee to enjoy your color changing mug. Well, if this is the first time you've ever come across one of my broadcasts, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. So my name is Ronnie Harden. I'm an editor. I am a content writer. I'm also a writing coach slash former high school English teacher, but I like to call it writing coach because that's what I did anyway. Um, I love helping writers of all ages and all levels tell their stories, work on their stories, tweet their stories, craft their stories. So that's what I do. And so I do this every Saturday. I pop on here and share some coffee, catch up with you, catch up with all the stories that have been going on this past week. And boy, let me tell you, we've got some doozies. Isn't it amazing how when you really pay attention to what's going on out there, you know, edit all the, edit all the unnecessary, right? So I, I love being an editor because we remove and we take out all the unnecessary things so that you get the best story. So that's what I do. So let's catch up on some of these stories that happened this past week. Ooh, there was some doozies. Let's rewind all the way back to Sunday, March the 7th. Do you remember that? That was the widely announced, um, heavily promoted interview with Harry and Meghan and Oprah. Oof. Now we're going to come back to that because a lot about what I'm talking about this weekend is about change. This is the one all about time changing. So first, let's make a note. I'm going to say this many times throughout the broadcast, but tonight is the time change. Now, our phones, most of our digital devices and everything should roll over if you have them set automatically to adjust for the time change, but we are springing forward. Now, I love the time change because it means um, we have more sunlight at night. Um, the days get longer. It seems like the days get longer, but we have more we adjust our clock to be in the most daylight time. And uh, I love it. Springtime, doing things outside. It's wonderful. So tonight, any of your clocks that you have to set manually, set them forward one hour. Remember when we used to have to worry about making sure we had our clocks set correctly because of church service? especially if you were on the worship team or you served on one of the teams and you had to get there on time and you overslept <laughs> because you got to change your clocks. And so service was happening and you already got there. Oops. Yeah, I've had a few of those faux pas, but thankfully to our digital technology, those things will roll. So time change. So we're going to be talking all about this theme of time change, how something like changing time can be a theme that you develop into a story. Or maybe time travel, right? Because that's changing time. You're actually changing time periods instead of time zones. Anyway, well, we're talking all about 
change. So as you know, a lot of things happened this week. So here's a couple of them. Here's a couple. So we're going to get back to the Harry and Meghan um, interview because I have questions. You know me. <laughs> I have questions. Because first up, you know I love the queen. Uh, the queen is like my grandmother. Um, I have sort of mentally replaced my grandmother with her. Because actually today is the 11th anniversary of my grandmother passing. We will not speak of those things over the queen. However, I love the queen. There's some problems in the queendom, and I have questions. But we'll get back to that. But um, so Monday rolled around. It was a Monday. It was a, a productive Monday for me. Monday is always a busy day. I get all my admin stuff uh, done. I look ahead for the week. I try to catch up on any emails that came in. Um, I delete a bajillion emails. Do you guys ever like? It's just. <laughs> it's, all I feel like, unsubscribe, 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 unsubscribe. Every time they ask you for your email, can I have your email address? No. I know what you're doing. Well, I have to say, no. Put my phone number in. <laughs> I'll ignore you there as well. Um, but Monday, Monday was pretty non-eventful for me. Non-eventful. So Tuesday, Tuesday, a couple of things happened uh, that were kind of sad. Um, because they had to do with, I guess, passing. Not really passing, but things that are that left us. Um, and so one of them was a newsman, a new, a journalist that has been around for a long, long time. So I'm going to pull up a picture here and show you. This is a very old picture. Okay. But the guy on the left, the guy on the left, that's right here. Let me point correctly. The guy right here. On, okay. On the left of the picture, that's Roger Mudd. And Roger Mudd was one of the anchors of, you, you can see this stellar, a news reporting team at CBS. So uh, from left to right, it's Roger Mudd. And then next to him, the only woman in the picture is Leslie Stahl. So if you've ever seen her on 60 Minutes, uh, Le that's Leslie Stahl. And she worked with, of course, Walter Cronkite is in the center. Next to him is Dan Rather. And on the very right is Mike Wallace. You probably recognize all of these uh, names, people, figures, but Roger Mudd passed away at the age of uh, 93, I believe, let me check here. Yes, he was 93 years old. So, um, you know, pillars in our generation's news and media people of the old guard that was really about uh, deep investigative reporting. Um, and so Roger Mudd, may he rest in peace. Um, thank you for your service, sir. Thank you for all of the stories that you brought, um, you know, he was, he covered a lot of the stories on the Kennedys, all of the family and what was going on. So, um, and he was a reporter that really wanted to handle those kinds of stories, really got to interview and talk to and let people know what was going on during that, you know, time period. So stories, all kinds of stories. And he, um, I mean, gosh, I remember him being on the news as one of the anchors I watched growing up. And of course, I'm dating myself now, so we'll just, let's see how our mug's doing. <laughs> we, still, we still got battery power. I remember watching Roger Mudd on, uh, on CBS News. So, you know, these are the legendary people who, in my childhood, it's this generation, you know, he's 93. So we are losing those pillars of this generation marking time and things changing. So as we, you know, Mike Wallace and Dan Rather have all gone off to do their own thing. I think Dan Rather retired. Mike Wallace is still with uh, 60 Minutes, I believe. So he was, he was amazing. He was a hero in the CBS News Washington Bureau, said Susan Zervinsky, president and senior executive of CBS News. He was a journalist of enormous integrity and character. He would not budge if he believed he was right and would not compromise his ethical standards. He was an inspiration to all of us in the Bureau. On a personal note, I sat directly across from him in the DC newsroom. Roger was big, not just in his physical presence, but he was larger than life. So, Roger Mudd, legendary uh, political investigative reporter, passed away at the age of 93. So, we lost another person of our uh, past. Now, this one 
you know, what I, I actually, what I did is I posted this picture on my socials and I wanted to see what people had to say. I just wanted to see their reactions because, and of course the, the reactions as with anything are across the board, right? But here's, here's something that was really interesting. How many of you remember like um, the Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? And they would come on with the Roadrunner and, and the, uh, uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> What was the bird he was chasing? Uh, why can't I remember that now? The coyote at Roadrunner. Thank you. Oh my gosh. It's been so long. But the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner hour. Do you remember that? I remember that as a kid. And uh, gosh, dating myself again. And so there was one character that, um, that was on the program and he is no longer. So he was removed from the Space Jam sequel that's getting ready to come up. Uh, so Warner Brothers decided to pull the Pepe Le Pew character. And so, um, you know, here's the thing, guys. <laughs> Things from a long time ago look weird, you know, 60 years later. 50 years later, right? A generation is 100 years, wouldn't you say? A generation of, of people like, where things really change. And so this is changing. Um, was I was I offended by Pepe Le Pew? Did it make me feel uncomfortable? No, I knew him to be just the, uh, you know, the type of guys that are very forward in their presentation for their adoration and love. Um, you know, now, because of the, uh, the Me Too movement, and the rise in cases of abuse and bullying, um, not so much appropriate anymore. And so Warner Brothers pulled him and it's it kind of removed that character just to make sure that our children are not seeing or being exposed to things that might be inappropriate for today's society. You know, long time ago, I mean, we used to do things in the 70s. <laughs> There's some fashion styles that we did in the 70s that I know I don't want coming back or sticking around, right? Uh, there's a reason why they stay in the 70s or the, you know, those fashion choices. Well, a lot of social choices do as well. And as we learn, as we grow as a people, there are certain things in our society that change and especially with programming for children, right? Because we don't want to have any kind of images. Now, there's a lot to be said then, you know, for video games. Really, we let our children play video games. This guy, was this guy that bad? And yet some of the video games that are out there that children are playing can be violent, very violent. So where do we draw the line on those, right? This is why I have questions. What's, what's the real issue here? And what's the big deal you know and, and again a lot of people have different feelings on these things just like we're going to talk about harry and megan and a lot of people have a lot of different feelings about that you know inappropriate behavior inappropriate conversations things that affect the mental health and uh sometimes the physical well-being of other people right people let pew he did not take no for an answer he he uh you know Made a move on the cat all the time. The cat was always struggling to get away from him. And the looks on the faces of the cat was always like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know? Uh, to someone who experienced um, abuse from someone, that could be a little difficult for them to watch. So we don't want children watching these and thinking that that kind of behavior is okay or funny. So Peppy Le Pew. Made the news this week. Big story. People had feels all over the place about it. Oh, my goodness. Well, so there was another one, another cool story. And this is a really, um, it's not a weird story. It doesn't make you feel strange or anything. This is actually a cool story. Um, but it has to do with someone, again, in this generation leaving us. And so this week, we lost someone really um, monumental that impacted all of our lives. How many of you raise your hand if you 
if you grew up with cassette tapes. I mean, I grew up with eight tracks. I remember my mom having an eight track player in the car, but cassette tapes. How many of you, the boom box with a cassette tape player where you could record songs on the radio, right? And then play them back. And you had to make sure you were, you were listening so that you could be there to push play, play, you know, and record. Well, the gentleman who was responsible for all those wonderful cassette tapes was Mr. Lou Ottens. Lou Ottens uh, was the inventor of the cassette tape and he passed away at the age of 94. 94. So he passed away in his home in Dweezel uh, in the Netherlands on Saturday. The cause of death was not given. An estimated 100 billion cassette tapes have been sold worldwide, according to Philips, the company he began working for in 1952. Ottens also supervised the team that developed the compact disc or the CD. So if you have cassette tapes <laughs> that are now an art installation in your room <laughs> or in your house somewhere, um, if you have CDs, uh, remember when we used to get uh, music on CDs and burn them to our computer? <laughs> and how we used to transfer them onto our iPods, all of that technology was made possible because of Mr. Ottens. Thank you, Mr. Ottens. Thank you for, uh, let's see, I've got to get this pointing thing down. Is it this way? No, it's this way. <laughs> this is so weird. Mr. Ottens, I cannot tell you. In fact, right over there on top of my filing cabinet, which also should tell you how old I am <laughs> keeping things, I actually have some cassette tapes sitting up there um, on my desk. You know, it, it was, it, who didn't have their cassette player playing and, and just wore out cassette tapes listening to great bands, great music. So Mr. Ottens, thank you. What a great story about his life. So he revolutionized, let's see, in 1960, Ottens and his team developed the first portable tape recorder. At the time, all recorders used the reel-to-reel -reel system, which meant the tape had to be manually wound. He revolutionized recorders two years later by inventing the compact disc. Because of the laborious nature of the reel-to-reel -reel process, Ottens wanted to simplify the process. He cut out a, a block of wood that would fit into the side of his jacket pocket to find an ideal size for the new carrier. The block became the model after which the first portable cassette recorder was made. Remarkably, his wooden prototype was later lost when used to prop up his jack while changing a flat tire. Oh my goodness. In 1963, the development of the cassette and the playback device had done so well that they were presented at the International Funkausstellung, a trade exhi exhibition for audio products in Berlin. The cassette tape, uh, the cassette was quickly copied by, uh, oh, let's see, guests from Japan were inspired by his invention. The cassette was quickly copied by Japanese manufacturers into a different format and sold onto the Japanese market. The cassette recorder was a huge hit around the world, but particularly with young people in the 1960s, the 1970s, and the 1980s. And I'm telling you, Michael and I were talking about this earlier, but great, The Grateful Dead um, was probably the biggest purveyor of and supporter of the cassette tape industry of their fans recording their shows and sharing them with people. It was the early days of uh, file sharing on cassette tapes. The device helped capture iconic sounds, according to Phillips, which recounted a tale shared by Rolling Stone's Keith Richards. Here's a story, okay? So here's a story. Keith Richards wrote in his 2010 autobiography, Life, I wrote the song Satisfaction in my sleep. I didn't know at all that I had recorded it. The song only exists, thank God, to the little Phillips cassette recorder. I looked at it in the morning. I knew I had put a new tape in the night before, but it was at the very end. Apparently, I had recorded something. I rewound and then satisfaction sounded and then 40 minutes of snoring. 
Otten supervised the team that invented the CD, which was produced extensively by Sony Phillips and sold more than 200 billion, with a B, copies worldwide. He retired in 1986. In 2013, on the 50th anniversary of the cassette tape, a special exhibition was created to honor Auden's work at the Phillips Museum. And the first ever cassette recorder still lies on display as a testimony to his foresight and innovation. Imagine a prototype of the wood block that he cut and put in his pocket because, well, that's how great ideas start. So Mr. Ottens, thank you. Thank you for your creative genius and thank you for bringing such a wonderful thing to the public because we all loved it and we all used it. So stories of amazing people and things that have happened. So let's get back to this whole Harry and Meghan thing. You know, because if, if, you're, if you're anyone who is aware or, or if you just don't care about it, basically it's, it's Prince Harry, who is Queen Elizabeth's grandson. Um, I don't know, what is he, 97th in line for the throne. And he and his wife got married. Uh, they stepped away from royal duties. And now they left the UK and they had an interview with Oprah Winfrey and leveled some pretty serious accusations against the institution they call the institution of the monarchy, which ultimately is represented by the royal family. So, whoo, look, my battery is, I'm at half capacity now. So what did you think about that? Well, see, I have questions. You know me, I always, I have questions. Um, I have questions. How did you not know what you were marrying into? How did you not know what you were marrying into? And that has, and that that goes for both of them, not just for one or the other. Harry, did you not think about what the repercussions were going to be when you married? What were you? What were your expectations, and did you voice them at the time before you got married? Megan, you are a, a level of celebrity. Did you not understand what you were marrying into? Did you think it was different? And again, you know, it didn't work with Diana. Diana tried to change it. Diana tried to. Um, and, and so Harry saw that repeating with his own wife and wanted to take a step back. I totally understand that. And I totally respect him for that. And I totally respect Megan for standing up and not allowing someone to make her feel less than. I mean, this was a great opportunity for change, for new things to come about, maybe take the monarchy in a different direction. Oh, but we hit a snag. And, and nobody's law pointing or exactly saying who's at fault. Um, I don't know. I have questions. I I watched the interview, I listened to the words he was saying, and I listened to the words that he chose. And I, I also listened for the words that he didn't choose and the things that they didn't say uh, to try to piece my own idea together. And so I have questions, right? Um, was the interview necessary to, to do it that way, what was the purpose? Was it to tell your story? I think that's fabulous. I mean, everybody deserves the ability to tell their story. Um, I think this was decided upon in a certain way to do. I mean, they came here, Tyler Perry helped them out and didn't hold an interview about it. I mean, we didn't even know. Tyler Perry was involved in helping them until they did this interview, right? It was all done very quietly, very respectfully, just, you know. So, and also, you know, that Harry inherited $13 million of his mother's money. 13 million, because remember she was, she was of um, lineage as well. That's why she was chosen to marry Charles. So 
he inherited money, so it's not like they're broke. Harry, could you not afford security for your family? Were you depending upon that from the crown because you always had it? So for someone who's lived a very privileged and entitled life, this is what was going to happen when you stepped away from that. So what, what did you expect was going to happen? And you have $13 million. Can you not live on $13 million? I have questions. I appreciate Megan standing up for herself. As always, I think there are ways that, that it can be done without um, damaging your family because it's your family. At the end of the day, it's your family. And name for me any leader or institution we have other than Christ the Lord that has lasted for 2,000 years that we still have tangible living evidence of that lineage with us in the form of the queen. And I, I would love to be able to trace my roots to Queen Elizabeth and Henry VIII and King Edward and he, all the, all the way back, all the way back. Oh, I, I can't trace my ancestry all that way back. And there's living evidence there in England when you go see it. Oh, but there has been a wounding and there has been um, problems, generational problems that are centuries old that have been perpetuated over the years of how we treat other people. So things need to change, right? Things need to change. I think Harry and Megan were, they're doing this interview so that they can help get things to change. I mean, it bodes really well for their new organization. We got a lot of publicity about that. Hey, any publicity is good publicity. But I think they needed to get a way to be able to live their life serve people and do the things that they wanted to do. And they felt encumbered and, and looked down upon and devalued. I, I wouldn't want to stay. So how do we fix it? Things have to change. Things have to change. Oh, by the way, this is your halfway point reminder that you need to set your clocks forward tonight when you go to sleep. <laughs> right? Because I'm almost running out of battery power. Times change. This is a color changing mug and it changes because it lets me know that my coffee is almost out and it's time to get a refill. And so there are times when things point to areas in our life where we want them to change. We want them to change and it's hard. It's hard. We've gone through a lot of change with this pandemic, right? So let's learn some Hawaiian words, shall we? Let's learn your Hawaiian word of the week because you know, it's a part of my Hawaiian culture. I'm a Hawaiian girl living in Dallas, Texas. Yes, I am. And I like to share a little bit of my Hawaiian culture with you every week when I do these podcasts. So now would be a good time to teach you your Hawaiian word of the week. Very important. Um, oops, and I forgot to edit it here, so let me do that little change here just really quickly and make sure we do that. All right. All right, so your Hawaiian word of the week, okay? Are you ready for it? Your Hawaiian word of the week is ho o loli. O loli, okay. Loli means to change, to affect change, right? Uh, if you're going to change your mind, if you're going to change your clothes, you know, there's uh, o loli maika, which means, I mean, there's another word that says to change, but o loli means to change, to change. Things need to change. We change our clothes. We don't want to wear the same thing every single day with the same clothes, same clothes, same clothes. After a while, oof the stank and you have to put them away change clothes right my hair changed my hair changed when i went through cancer treatment and i lost all my hair and now my hair is growing back and it's a change for me because it's it's a little you know I, my gray came in a little more because of the chemo treatment 
It's curlier because it's shorter. I never had my hair short before. It was a big change for me. It was a big change to lose all of my hair, my eyelashes, everything. It's a big change for my body to go through. It was not fun, right? We went through change because of the pandemic. Things changed in our world. Our way we did things, the way we taught school, the way we did business, everything, entertainment, everything completely changed. Sometimes change is good. Sometimes change is not good. So let me show you something else that's been going on because we talk about, we talk about change. Ooh, so in Hawaii, all this past week, they have been having flooding rain. I'm talking 19 to 24 inches uh, within 24 hours. Guys, it's been unreal. Let me show you the picture. This is from the KHON news story. This is on uh, Maui. And this is, I mean, incredible. I think I have, hold on, let me get a browser up here and I can show you what's going on because the state of Hawaii has been under a, uh, they have been under a evacuation notices. Okay, so let me see. So there's that picture. You see the, the flooding there, serious. I mean, torrential rain like they normally don't see. Um, it's crazy. But I'm going to share with you another screen so you can see where I am. Here, here we go. I'm going to share that so you guys can see. I'll put it here in the side. I mean, there it is. Where are you going? Come on. There it is. Okay. So, Here's the story that was out uh, two days ago. So, prompting emergency. Look at this. This is um, Kaupakalua Dam in the Haiku area of the of Maui. But look at that's no road. You don't see a road. Look at that. So, Governor David Ige signed a proclamation on Tuesday to release funds to help people <coughs> who were impacted by this. The order covers the counties of Hawaii, Maui, Kalawao, Ka and Kauai. Um, it's, it's been horrible. The flooding has been catastrophic. They've not seen rains like this in well over 25 to 30 years. Uh, they're worried about the dams giving way. The Kaupakalua Dam was under danger of possibly breaking. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a real flooding situation we've not seen in a long time, some residents said. But they've not seen flooding like this in well over 25 years. So, I mean, it's crazy, guys. Change. Change to the weather. Change to how, you know, this is end of March, the springtime, right? It's coming in, flooding on Hawaii. So if you look on your Weather Channel app or you look at and stuff, you think about the Hawaiian Islands, say a prayer for the Hawaiian people because where are they going to go? They didn't know where to go but the water. They have to move inland, hopefully. But hopefully those floods and everything. Luckily, there's been no deaths and no major damage yet, but it's just, it's been horrible. They've had to really shut down roads and everything. So, change. Po Ololi. Another hard thing of change that's happening on the Hawaiian Island is the wonderful uh, a business that's been there for 170 years. How many of you, you know a business that's been around for 170 years? You guys know any? Well, let me show you. So this is Love's Bakery. Love's Bakery. I don't know if you live somewhere where you have like a local brand. Um, you have rainbow bread or some kind of, well, Love's Bakery has been on the, all the, uh, the Hawaiian islands since 1851. 1851. On June 19th, 1851, a baker from Scotland named Robert Love arrived in Honolulu with his wife, Margaret, and three sons from Sydney, Australia. The 80-day voyage on an American ship named Adirondack was grueling. Oof, imagine being 80 days on a ship. But Robert immediately began to work on his dream. By July 12th, 1851, he had obtained a retail store license that permitted him to operate a bakery and sell its products. In less than two years, he opened the first Love's Biscuit and Bread Company on Nu'uanu Street in 18. 
53. So that little company specialized in rebaking bread that would come in from the sailing ships because they had become almost inedible. And so they were a stop. Imagine they were like, they were like the gas station on the side of the road. That's, they were like Bucky's with all the snacks and the food. And they got the stuff and they were making really great breads and pastries. And now they got, oh, no more loves donuts. Um, they were powdered sugar donuts. So anything like that that you could imagine. So they, the business was expanded in 1924 when Loves opened a second location in Evile that produced bread and rolls. From there, it goes to 1932. And by 1943, the demand for bread and crackers increased due to the demands of both the armed forces and the civilians. So a new plant was opened on Kapahulu Avenue. So over the years, they modernized. They began um, shipping all over. And so they, of course, the company has changed hands and sold many times. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, Love's Bakery is going to close at the end of March after 170 years on the islands. The pandemic really hit businesses hard. Businesses that have been around for a long time, 170 years. So we say aloha oi to Love's Bakery. Thank you for all of the love, all the aloha that you gave to all the locals, all the kama'aina, all the visitors and the tourists, the servicemen and women, um, Love's Bakery closing at the end of the month. So a lot of Hawaiian people are going to be very sad that loves is changing and closing. So, oh, oh, lonely. change. What do you do when change happens? What do you do when things change and, and you don't want it to change? What happens with that, right? Just like with Harry and Megan, they weren't expecting things to change. They were trying to work out a way to see if they could change the way the monarchy did things that would work for their lives. They couldn't find a way to agree. And so they had to leave, they had to separate. And now there is wounding happening. Now there is, is, is pain happening. Uh, there's resentment building. This is why we can't have this happen. We need more love in our life. I wish loves was gonna stay open um, I won't be able to get back to the island before they do. So my last memory of Love's was Love's sugar, uh, powdered sugar donuts. Good bread, good bread. So we say aloha oi to Love's. A lot of change, guys. A lot of things that are changing. Do you know what don't change are great stories. These are all stories. Sometimes stories have a sweet ending. Sometimes stories have a difficult ending right? But all stories are important. All stories matter. So you want to check out some great books. I always love to recommend some good stories and some good books for you guys to read. I'm closing all of this so you don't need that and I don't need this anymore because I want to show you guys some new books that are coming out that I really think you might like to read. Some books that have um, a great, a feel good, okay? Stories that we can get into that make us feel lighthearted, that, that give us hope again, that give us encouragement, sometimes direction, sometimes help us discipline and learn how to tailor our lives. So the first little story that I'm going to recommend, especially if you are a dog lover, is the story of Oliver. Look at his face. Hi, Oliver. It's the story of Oliver. On Valentine's Day 2019, someone stole Stephen Carino's dog, Oliver, from his car. Oh, it's always the scariest thing when I see these dogs in cars. Don't leave your dogs in the car. Don't take them with you unless you can take them with you. Don't leave them in the car. So having lost his mother at 13 and grown, growing up with an alcoholic father, he could always count on his dogs for comfort and company. But now his beloved Oliver was missing. Stephen felt utterly alone. Then the miracle happened. And in a series of near impossible coincidences, people from different walks of life 
crossed paths with Oliver and with Stephen. Hardworking immigrants, wealthy suburbanites, car mechanics, deli workers, old friends, close relatives, street cops, gang members, a TV news reporter, social media followers around the world, and one very gifted hairdresser, all playing a part in Stephen's desperate journey to find Oliver. In the middle of it all, Stephen realized that no one is ever truly alone and that the power of community can be life changing. Oliver is not just a book about a stolen dog. At its core, it's a story about kindness, friendship, and the power of faith. As Stephen says, this is more than just a dog story. This is an everybody story. So you want to pick up a, a copy of that. That might be a really great book to have in your library, especially if you have dog lovers. So check out the book, Oliver. It'll be a great story, and I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, so the next book that I can't wait to share with you, it's a children's book. I'm super excited about this one. It's going to be fantastic. Um, if you ever read Rachel Held Evans, if you ever read any of her works, or if you ever um, loved her stories, she has a children's book coming out thanks to her husband and a photographer friend uh, named Matthew Paul Turner. She is going to be posthumously publishing a book called What is God Like? What is God Like? Children who are introduced to God through attending church or having loved ones who speak about God often have a lot of questions, including this ever popular one. What is God like? The late Rachel Held Evans loved the Bible and loved showing God's love through the words and pictures found in the ancient text. Through these pictures from the Bible, children see that God is like a shepherd. God is like a star. God is like a gardener. God is like the wind and more. God is a comforter and support. So if you've ever had a child ask, or if you had children, um, nieces, nephews, grab a copy of this book because this will help open their eyes to who God really is and what he's like. So, and the last book I want to share with you, and I'm super excited about it because I am involved on the book launch team for this book. Um, he is a business mentor of mine. Um, I've been involved with his work for the last eight years. And it's John Acuff's new book called Soundtracks. I have been participating in the uh, beta, the, the uh, advanced reader copy for the book. Um, it's really incredible. John has been taking us through. Uh, he took us through a challenge in one of his groups. Uh, there are some of us who are in a, a course that he has launched that he is trying out for the first time on this book. Um, and so it's an incredible, incredible book. And it talks about soundtrack. So this is a little workbook I have going through uh, for the thing that he has created. But he, he talks about how our, we live our life with soundtracks, thoughts that play over in our head over and over and over and over again that have been planted there that we've somehow picked up throughout our life. Um, an exercise he gave us is think of three songs, three songs that you can immediately think of that you know that whenever you hear them, man, they take you back to a certain memory. I mean, the minute that that song, the first four beats of that song play, you, you know where you are, man, you know, this was a song I would listen to this in high school, or this was playing when we got married, or those songs, right? That's why we know them, and they're so important to us. Well, we have thoughts that do that, too. Thoughts like, well, I don't know why I'm live streaming. Who would watch this show anyway? Thoughts about, I can't do that. That's too hard, or I don't have time to learn that, or oh, I'm trying to get through a pandemic, or I've got kids, or oh, I've, I'm in this job, and I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. All of those things that play over in our head over and over and over again. So John is talking about the surprising solution to overthinking. And he says that overthinking is when what you think gets in the way of uh, what you want and who you are. That what you think gets in the way of what you want and who you are. And so he takes you through all these different levels. He has, it's a very well-researched book. Um, he interviewed over 10,000 people, and they all said that 98.7 of them all struggled with overthinking. So if you struggle with overthinking and want to get those thoughts out of your head, grab a copy of John's book. The book is releasing. It's, you can pre-order it. The book is releasing April 6th. 
I'm going to be doing a special um, sort of focus on the book for the month of April that you'll definitely want to catch. And more importantly, I hope that you will come back and have more coffee with me. All right. So next Saturday, guys, right here, don't forget, you can follow me here on, on, on this page or you can follow me on my socials at Lana Harden. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can drop me a note right here. Let me tell you, this is where you can contact me right here. Go to ronaharden.com forward slash contact. Drop me a note. Let me know. I can help you tell your story. Or if you want to get any of these recommendations, I'll be posting these here on my page and on my social media accounts. And you can also always catch this live broadcast done recorded and other live broadcasts we've had with interviews of folks that I love to talk to about their stories. So you can catch all of those on my YouTube channel. And we'll be back here next weekend, guys. And who knows where I'll be going live from, all right? Take care. Thanks so much. It's great to have you here with me. And um, we'll talk next Saturday, all right? Got to go fill my mug because my battery's out. Have a fantastic weekend, guys. I'll see you back here next weekend.